This is the OSCE guide on clinical pelvimetry. First, identify the parts of the bony pelvis. So we have the ilium, the pubis, the ischium, the symphysis pubis, the sacral promontory, sacrum, and the coccyx. And this is the linea terminalis. So the area above the linea terminalis is what we call the false pelvis, and the area beneath the linea terminalis is called the true pelvis. Next, identify the shape of the pelvic inlet. Identify whether it's gynecoid, android, anthropoid, or platypeloid. In this pelvic model that we have, this is a gynecoid type of pelvic inlet. Next, measure the examining hand from the tip of the index finger up to the base of the thumb using a tape measure. So in this picture that we have here, the length from the tip of the index finger up to the base of the thumb is about 11.5 centimeters. So now we evaluate the pelvic inlet. Now, the only way by which we can clinically assess the pelvic inlet is by measuring the diagonal conjugate. So, we measure the diagonal conjugate by introducing the index and the middle fingers under the symphysis pubis and reaching for the sacral promontory. Now, note where the inferior border of the symphysis pubis touches your examining hand, which is right here. Note also that in this video, the examining fingers can hardly reach the sacral promontory. Next, we have to report the findings for the pelvic inlet. Clinical pelvimetry findings for the pelvic inlet can be summarized as follows. So if the pelvic inlet is adequate, we can report it as diagonal conjugate more than 11.5 centimeters or sacral promontory cannot be reached. Now, if the pelvic inlet is inadequate, then we can report that as diagonal conjugate less than 11.5 centimeters or sacral promontory reached. Next, we evaluate the mid pelvis. So here are the steps to evaluate the mid pelvis. First, we check the sacral curvature, then measure the sacrosciatic notch, and normally this should accommodate two finger breadths. Next, we have to palpate the ischial spines, note whether it's blunt or prominent, then measure the bispinous diameter. Normally, this should be more than 8.5 centimeters. And lastly, we assess the splay of the side walls. Now, in assessing the splay of the side walls, we place our two examining fingers over the ischial spines like so, and our thumb over the ischial tuberosity. Now, if the ischial tuberosity is lateral to the ischial spines, then that is what we call a divergent pelvic sidewall. Now, if the ischial tuberosity is medial to the ischial spines, then that is what we call a convergent sidewall. Now, the clinical pelvimetry findings for the midplane can be summarized as follows. If the midplane is adequate, then we can report it as sacrum curved, sacrosciatic notch wide, ischial spines not prominent, bispinous diameter more than 8.5 cm, and pelvic sidewalls divergent. If the midplane is inadequate, then we can report it as sacrum straight or shallow sacral concavity, sacrosciatic notch narrow, ischial spines prominent, interischial diameter less than 8.5 cm, and the sidewalls are convergent. Lastly, we evaluate the pelvic outlet. So to evaluate the pelvic outlet, we must do the following steps. So first, we measure the interischial diameter by putting a closed fist in between the ischial tuberosities, and normally, this should accommodate four knuckle bones. 
Next, we estimate the subcubic angle and this should normally be at least 90 degrees. And lastly, we assess the mobility of the coccyx. So the clinical pulvimetry findings for the outlet can be summarized as follows. So if the outlet is adequate, we report it as intertuberous diameter more than 8.5 centimeters, subpubic angle more than 90 degrees, or we can also say wide subpubic angle, and finally, coccyx is movable. Now, if the outlet is inadequate, then we report it as intertuberous diameter less than 8.5 centimeters, subpubic angle less than 90 degrees, or narrow subpubic angle, and finally, coccyx not easily depressed or coccyx not movable. Thank you for watching this video.